Hi everyone. So in this video, <clears throat> we present, uh, we discuss three motivations for having convolutional kernels or convolutional layers. And uh, basically these three main motivations, they share uh, common uh, impacts or effects on the training of the deep neural network. All three of them contribute, have a generalization effect or, a, uh, or basically a regularization uh, effect. So they, uh, they tend to improve generalization. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of the key reasons why you find convolutional neural networks or uh, known as CNNs uh, used a lot. And the other reason is basically the first two of these, um, uh, of these three factors have also an effect on reducing the computational burden uh, of training the deep neural network. So they improve computational efficiency. Now, there is also a third factor, which is statistical efficiency. And statistical efficiency basically means that you need fewer examples uh, to reach the same performance, fewer training examples. And that's also a, a very important metric because it can also um, make you reach the desired performance after fewer iterations of many batch based training. So the three factors are basically sparse interactions because convolution is typically sparse, right? So the size of the convolutional kernel is typically much less than the input data, right? So than the input size, right? So if I have here uh, a layer that has, let's say 1000 units and another layer that has 1000 units, if I have a fully connected layer between them, then that would be 1 million weight parameters. But with convolution, basically, let's say I have a kernel and that kernel has size 5, right? So here, uh, that's 5, right? So these are 1,000. That's 1,000, right? And the kernel has size 5. Then basically, you have 5 weights. You don't even have 5,000. You only have five weights, right? Corresponding to that kernel because that kernel is shared among all the units. And that's the second factor, which is parameter sharing, right? So let's go back to the sparse interaction. Sparsity makes the, the learning for each unit is within only a local neighborhood of input units, right? So if I'm scanning an image, for example, I look only at a small part of the image, let's say an image of a face like this, so small part of the image, and then I try to extract a feature, and the second, the next small part of the image, and so on, right? That's for the first layer. Now, the, as, as we do convolution in later or deeper layers, right, maybe the, that, so I take the output, right, from, so let's say here I have a deep network, right? And uh, I want to know in the, in, the in the third layer here, right? So this is the first layer has the X's, the second layer has the H's, the third layer has the G's. So I want to know the unit G3 here, how much of the face or how much of the input image, right? Does it get affected by? So this is called the receptive field of a unit. That receptive field, even though the convolutional kernel is sparse or is small compared to the size of the input. So here I have the size of the input is five and the kernel of size three. So H2 here depends only on X1, X2, X3. H3 depends only on X2, X3, X4, right? So even though the size of the kernel is small, right? Compared to the input size, but because of the depth, the receptive field increases in deeper layers, right? And that what's, that's basically what allows uh, convolution to be very efficient, a very efficient way of training deeper neural networks, right? Because it reduces the number of parameters significantly through the sparse interaction and the parameter sharing, which we will discuss next. But it maintains the ability of units in deeper layers to be dependent or to capture features in a large part of damage. Right or to have a large receptive field. So the sparsity reduces me the memory requirement. This is obvious, right? Because you have fewer parameters. Fewer parameters think, for example, the memory requirement of backpropagation. So fewer parameter would reduce the memory requirement. And it can also improve statistical efficiency. And this is because of the regularization effect, 
right? So the regularization effect comes from the fact that every unit depend only on a small uh, on a small number of uh, of input units, right? So that reduces the chance of overfitting, right? So if I have a function of a hundred variables, I am more likely to uh, to overfit than if that function is in three or five variables, right? And um, and the statistical efficiency doesn't only come from the sparsity. So in general, this uh, concept of sparsity, like if you remember in the first section when we discussed the hidden layer activations, uh, and we mentioned that uh, after uh, the training matures, if you check the percentage of, uh, of active units in a hidden layer uh, of a successful network, you will find the percentage to be very small. So sparsity in general is a, is a phenomena that you will see it happening uh, over and over again in deep learning because it's very if it's a very effective pattern um, that happens when you have a complex model that generalizes well right so if you have a deep network that has good generalization performance sparsity tends to be embedded uh, as a pattern in the learning performance and here sparsity happens uh, <clears throat> because you have a few uh, weight parameters connected between the units in different layers, right? So this is the first uh, um, the first key motivation for using convolutional layers is that they are sparse compared to fully connected layers. The second is parameter sharing, right? So not only I have few parameters connected to every output unit, the parameters connected to different output units are the same. So I am sliding in that example here, right? I am sliding the same convolutional kernel, right? So if that's W1, this is W2, this is W3. If I have a unit here, that's the same W1, the same W2, the same W3, right? So I'm sharing the parameters between different units, right? So as I'm back propagating, I check that the impact of changing W1 on the cost will happen through all units in the layer, through all output units of the layer where W1 is a weight parameter, right? So this is what we mean by parameter sharing. Parameter sharing in general is a regularization or generalization strategy, right? Because it ties the learning between different parts of the network. Right? So between different units of the network, these units are learning together, right? So not only, not only does it lead to, does it have computational advantage because of the lower memory requirements and the faster back propagation, because it has only, the, the, there are fewer parameters, right? So in this example, instead of 5,000, I have only five parameters, uh, or here I have three, uh, if you take W1, W2, W3, then only three parameters. But parameter sharing is also useful for regularization, right? And if you remember when we discussed the regularization section, we discussed that you could do parameter sharing in semi-supervised learning between the unsupervised models, the generative model and the discriminative model, right? And this idea of tying the learning of different parts of a network or of different networks is useful for generalization because what one unit is learning could transfer to the other unit and so on, right? And because it also puts, um, like, uh, it puts a barrier on one unit being extra sensitive uh, or one unit overfitting basically to what it sees from the training examples, right? So this is the second key motivation. The third key motivation, and it is a, a byproduct of the first two, is equivariance to translation. Equivariance means the following, that if I translate, if I shift the input, so let's say I have an image, if I shift the image, right, let's say I shift it to the left, to the right, top, bottom, then the output of the convolution will also shift. So that means what? That means that when I detect a feature, like the eye in a, in a face, right, when I detect that feature in the training examples, that network can detect that feature if it's slightly mispositioned right so if that feature is uh, is situated 
in the input in in a slightly different position then the network can also learn it right so in general we say that a function is equivariant to another function if we could switch the order of applying these two functions right so uh, uh, let's say i have two functions f and g if f of g of x equals g of f of x then this is equivariant right so if g is a translation function and f is a convolution function then f and g are equivariant meaning that if I translate and then convolve, that's the same as if I convolve and then translate. And that's what we mean by uh, when you translate the input, the output of the convolution also gets translated. Sounds good? Now the last comment before I end this video, okay, is about parameter sharing. So parameter sharing is very useful, right? But it's important to uh, be careful when applying convolution because convolutional layers are very aggressive in applying parameter sharing, right? It's the same kernel applied to all parts of the input, right? So let's say the, uh, the face example, let's say the eyes can only be in the upper part of the face. Then I shouldn't have a convolutional layer for the whole face, right? For the whole input. I should have it only for the upper part and that's the kernel that tries to detect uh, the eyes. Right. In, in general, as we'll see in the rest of this section, people avoid this problem by basically um, a, a less computationally efficient approach, but having multiple kernels on the hope that one kernel will learn to get the features that are in the upper part. Other kernels will learn to get the features in the lower part without explicitly applying these kernels uh, to only part of the image. But that would be more uh, a more computationally efficient um, approach. So to recap, there are three motivations, sparse interaction because the kernel size is small, parameter sharing because it's the same kernel applied to all the input, equivariance to translation because shifting the input will also result in shifting the output of convolution. Thank you.